This is Covered Calls with Kevin Simpson, featuring expert insights and analysis from the industry's top investment professionals. If you'd like a deeper understanding of today's markets, this is the show for you. Thanks for tuning into our podcast, Covered Calls with me, Kevin Simpson, where our goal is to have conversations with the best and brightest minds on Wall Street. And we certainly have that today. Not sure how we tricked Anthony Scaramucci to coming on the show, but we're very, very lucky to have you. Thank you so much, Anthony. What do you mean trick? You, you wrote this spectacular book about wealth, which is not only just about like money, but it's about philosophy and how you have to think about life. And so it's a huge honor to be on. Yeah, I don't know about an honor, but thank you. I'm going to take a step back and give you an yeah. introduction that you so well deserve. I mean, your resume yeah. is so long. I could take up the whole conversation without you getting it. Well, I'm sure my it. mother wrote it for you. So you could you could truncate it. Okay. You know, and I <laughs> all right. So we'll say you. we'll say this. At a very early age, you you started working at Goldman Sachs. You got fired and then rehired. Yes. That that that's got to be a story. I got I got I got hired at age twenty five. I was I was fired eighteen months later. Uh, I can tell you the exact date. Actually, I was fired on February first, nineteen ninety one. I was twenty seven years old. It was a Friday night. You could go Google it. Uh, and I got rehired at Goldman Sachs on March twenty eighth, nineteen ninety one. And so I was out of Goldman Sachs for two months looking for a job. They gave me an eleven thousand dollars severance check, uh, and then I got the job back. I was in a hired into another division. So the personnel guy call, uh, the personnel woman calls and says, "Hey, you're never going to have to tell anybody you got fired. We're just going to mark you down as an interdepartmental transfer." I said, "Okay, that's great." She goes, "Can we get the eleven thousand dollars check <laughs> back? You know, the severance check." I was like, "There's no way." Okay, I mean, first of all, I'm impoverished. I've got racked with school debt. Um, my first job interview was a mortifying experience at Goldman because Kevin, I was in a hundred percent polyester. Okay. So I was fully flammable for my first job interview. I had the black Guido tie on, you know, the thin Guido tie. I had these cockroach killer shoes. They were like capizios, you know, with the points on them, those dance shoes from the eighties. And I probably looked like a young undertaker. You know, the hair was blown back like Tony Monero in Saturday Night Live. I had a black suit on. I had a white on white poly shirt with a black guido tie and i was explaining the ted spread and the euro dollar transactions and uh, i was doing net present value calculations for the goldman partner he's like okay listen man you're a smart guy you are the worst dress are we allowed to curse on the podcast yeah, oh, yeah, all right because right, i'm a little bit of a curse you are the worst dressed guy that we've met at the Harvard Law School. I cannot take you to Goldman Sachs dressed like this. You look like a bozo. Okay. I remember calling my mother. She was like, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You look fantastic. I'm like, Ma, I, I really don't think I did. So I went to Brooks Brothers. I got myself a credit card and I bought myself a suit. So now they're looking for the $11,000 back. I'm like, come on, guys. I'm trying to go from polyester to natural fiber. You're not getting the money back. You can tell anybody on planet Earth I got fired. I don't care. I had one suit probably for the first three, maybe six months of my job. Yeah, a couple you, shirts, a couple ties. You'd recycle. Yeah, you gotta you gotta it. dry clean it though. Otherwise, you start to smell like shit. You can't go to a meeting. You know. Sometimes you can't afford to dry clean it, so you know you put a little extra. No, I'm. I believe me. I, I I used to spray the stuff with cologne. I and look. It look. You know what though? When you start out like that, you have an appreciation for things. You know, and uh, I'm not saying if you grow up rich, you don't have an appreciation for things, but it's just different because. You know, you're you're coming from an angle of attack where you're behind the starting block, and so you know you got you got you got you got to move. You got to you got to move. You got to come around the track fast. So you left the Goldman Sachs. You started Oscar Capital Management. Later, you sold that to Newberger Berman. Then you started Skybridge Capital. You wrote four books and you created the Salt Conference. And I, I you know, I love that that concept. I mean, here we are, 2009, the financial recession we're in the midst of the crisis i'm gonna wave this is my fifth book you see that and uh i wrote this book because i need to explain this to my clients who are clueless about it and i don't want them to miss it but that's my fifth book right there the sweet life with bitcoin how i stop worrying about the cryptocurrency and you should too uh and i'm writing a fifth book right now on algorand which is another currency that i like a lot but i'm sorry i didn't mean to interrupt you but Okay, well, I, I don't, I don't think I'm smart enough to follow the Algorand conversation, but I definitely want to learn a lot about crypto. One of the things that you need to teach us and our viewers, who are financial advisors, is 
what what exactly is crypto? How can we get this to our clients? How can how can financial advisors help their clients get access to this burgeoning asset class? Maybe that's a good time to kind of jump into what you're doing at Skybridge. I'll come back to Salt because I really want to talk to you about that. But let's let's get into crypto. I'll, I'll say a couple of things. So my career has always been a study and adaptation and evolvement. I did start as a real estate investment banker, was fired in that job. I got rehired as an institutional salesperson. So I was actually on the very large trading desk at Goldman uh, selling research to large institutions. Uh, and I did that for about two and a half years. And then I requested a transfer to the private client area where I became effectively a broker or an FA or whatever you want to call it. Um, and the reason I did that is one of the guys that I was very close to was leaving for Frankfurt and he wanted somebody with some experience to replace him with some of his clients. And so I asked for permission to make that transfer. And of course, I was recommended for it. Uh, and so I spent five years or about four and a half years as a broker um, but before I left to start my own business. And my first business was a registered investment advisor. So, um, but I'm a study in involvement. I ended up uh, starting Skybridge after I sold my first business to Newberger Berman, which was then acquired by Lehman Brothers. And so I left there in 05 to start Skybridge. Skybridge started out as a hedge fund seeder, Kevin, and, and then a fund of funds, which it still has a great fund of funds business, over $3 billion in fund of funds activity. But, um, you know, when I got back from the White House, uh, there was experiences that I had in Washington. And by the way, if you're ever having a bad day out there, I just want you to imagine my ass getting fired from the White House and rolled in broken glass on Pennsylvania Avenue by the late night comedian. So, you know, if you're ever having a bad day, you can call me. I can cheer you up. But, but when I got back from the White House, I said, okay, this cryptocurrency thing is real. I need to understand it and I need to convince my clients about it. And I wasn't ready to do anything in cryptocurrency until certain measurements took place. And so what were they? Well, for me, uh, Bitcoin had to get to 100 million wallets uh, globally. Uh, that happened sometime around October, November of last year. Number two, I had to be comfortable if I was going to put several hundred million dollars in Bitcoin that I was going to be able to store it effectively. And then the last thing is I had to get comfortable with the regulation, which I'm happy to talk about. So once once I was comfortable with all three of those things, I made a $270 million investment in Bitcoin, which has now grown to uh, about $800 million in Bitcoin. I have several hundred million dollars in Ethereum and, and about $100 million in a smaller token called Algorand. Uh, so all told, we have over a billion dollars in cryptocurrencies. But to step back for a second, what is a cryptocurrency or what is a Bitcoin or what is the blockchain? And so I don't want to overly simplify it, but I think it's important for people to understand that all their money really is, is a ledger. Uh, it's, a, it's a ledger between us and our society. It allows us to avoid bartering. So I have money in my pocket. Um, it's always worth less than the goods and services that we're trading for. So I, I brought some props for the, because I knew we were going to talk about cryptocurrency. I brought some props. Okay. So let me show you these. Okay. So see that in my neighborhood, see what that is. Those are Italian singles. You see those? Okay. And so they're actually, it's not paper money, believe it or not. It's actually made out of fabric. Okay. This is a uh, 75% cotton. It's a uh, 25% linen, but, but Kevin, let's stipulate that's worthless. You know, it's worthless. I know it's worthless. It's a piece of fabric. Okay. But it's got some green on it. It's got a counterfeit strip. There's uh, my favorite founding father, Ben Franklin. Of course, you know you're in America, Kevin, when white dead males are on the money. Okay, everyone else is using a diversity of people, but we've got white dead men on the money. So you know you're in America. But here it is. This is something that I can hand to somebody and I can give it to them and they'll give me something. There's an exchange. We know it's worthless, but. We've accepted it as a tender, as a currency. So what did Satoshi Nakamoto say? He basically said, listen, um, we can perfect this because what happens is this gets issued by the government and they print more of these things. We've expanded the Fed's balance sheet to $9 trillion. Uh, we've increased the money supply in the last 21 months by 42%. So there should be no 
lack of understanding why we have inflation. If I put 42% more dollars in the system, it's going to show up in higher prices. And so, so what Nakamoto said, and he actually wrote this paper after the last crisis, the 2008 crisis, he released it on Halloween in 2009. And he basically said, listen, all money is, is a ledger. It's a uh, balance sheet of liabilities and assets among individuals. And we've always gotten our money from the government or you know, maybe we started out with a seashell and we turned it into a gold coin. But I'm telling you, because of modern technology, I can create something for you that is a distributed ledger. And so it's decentralized and I can, you know, it'll ultimately become valuable because it is electronically pure. It's scarce. You can't create any more of it. There's no policymaker or politician that can come in capriciously and alter it. And so I'm going to put it out there. I'm going to explain to you what it is in nine pages. I'm going to put it out there. And if I'm right, it will become very valuable because human beings will recognize that it's an unalterable currency. And so he did that, you know, probably 12 years ago now. Uh, and uh, he's ultimately been right because what's happened is people have gravitated to it. 100 million wallets, as I mentioned last year, there's now 240 million wallets. And, you know, Bitcoin went from less than a penny to being worth today. It's, you know, let's call it 45 to 50,000 because it's trading with some level of volatility. And so when I did my homework and research on it, and I write about it in this book and I, and I put Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper in the book. I'm just trying to explain to my clients that if your grandparents had a rotary phone and your parents had a touchstone phone and you and I have and our kids have a smartphone uh, and technology has improved every aspect of our lives, or at least made our lives different. Uh, how could it be that technology wouldn't improve our money? Now, just think about this thing for a minute. Um, it's too good to be true, right? So when someone says to you, you're an investor, and you're trained, and you talk to FAs, you're an FA, you're an experienced guy. If someone tells you something is too good to be true, run, right? Oh, my God, it's too good to be true. Run. But yet there are things in our society that are too good to be true. This phone is one of those things. This phone can eat every single book in this library stored in the phone. But there's room for my videos, my music videos. There's room for my kids' videos. There's room for my family album. Uh, but there's more. If I told you you could have my library card from the Library of Congress and you needed to write a 20-page research report, here's my library card. Or, Kevin, here's my phone. What do you want? You want my library card at the Library of Congress and you want to work your way through the Dewey Decimal System? Or do you want access to my phone and all of the things my phone can touch to help you develop that research paper? So when I tell people, they say, well, something's too good to be true, run from it. Well, there's a lot of things that are too good to be true. This phone is a representation of that in our society. And so uh, maybe Bernie Madoff and charlatans are too good to be true. I got that. But when you have technology that's benefiting a society or a world, you have to at least understand it. Then you can make a decision whether or not to invest in it. And so for me, what do we know about the blockchain? And I'll be brief on this. We know that I can transfer value from myself to you over the blockchain. We know that it will go to you unhacked. Uh, uh, he created it. 12 and a half years ago, it has not been hacked. It's literally, if you really understand how it works, it's sort of impossible to hack because the permutations are happening, trillions of them at the same time, and no real computer system or even a supercomputer, a quantum computer could catch up to it. And so, so I can transfer value to you permissionless. I don't have to go through a third party. I don't have to go to a bank. I can just transfer from me to you. Take a minute. And understand the gravity of that. Uh, Jack Dorsey, Mark Andreessen, any of these guys. When Andreessen realized what the blockchain was, he said, oh my God, this is bigger than the Netscape browser that I myself developed. Why? Well, it's a delayering mechanism, Kevin. Uh, if I can go peer to peer, I can cut out third parties. Two quick examples and then I'll shut up. Uh, let's talk about a restaurant. I... Uh, MasterCard and Visa have a lock of 3% uh, 
royalties on just about every business in the world. But what if I could go direct? What if I'm at the bar and I'm paying for my meal and I smart wallet my currency to the waiter or the bartender and now I've avoided the 3% charge? Okay. Or what about I'm doing a transaction? I'm going to buy your stock peer to peer. Right now, if I'm going to buy your stock, it's got to go through seven different entities before it gets to me. But over the blockchain, we can go peer to peer. This is a transformative, super efficient delayering mechanism for a society. And whether Jamie Dimon likes it or Warren Buffett thinks it's rat poison or Charlie Munger thinks it's the worst thing that ever happened to the civilization, it's happening with or without them. And I need to make sure that my clients are a part of it. With so many different cryptos, and I was fascinated. I looked thinking maybe there was a handful and kept coming to learn that there's hundreds, if not thousands. But probably maybe. about 8,500 that I'm aware of. How many will the five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, how many do we need? How many will, will there be in practical existence? Yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Obviously, I don't know the answer. I can only surmise that there will be 15 to 20 of them. Again, this is my opinion. Okay. And I could be wrong. And that's one of the things I've been humbled by life. I've been humbled by market. So I don't want to sp speak overly definitively, but I will say this to you that uh, 15 to 20 of them will be in existence. Uh, a lot of these will go by the wayside. A lot of these are uh, whims. Some of them were just made for fun. Sure. Uh, and they don't really have use cases. And I would go back to pets.com or eToys or companies that you and I would remember from the late 90s that were sucked into the mania of the internet in the first place. And you'd say, okay, well, uh, uh, why is um, why are there so many? And the answer is this is what happens. You know, there's excitement around a technology. There's a mania that develops. There's a proliferation of things. And there's an eventual collapse and there's a consolidation and there's names that are left. Amazon's one of those names. You know, Microsoft uh, is one of those names. Uh, we can go through all the different names, but pets.com, eToys, companies like that are, are by the wayside. So I, I think that uh, um, this is a lot like the enterprise software. You know, uh, Oracle is in existence. We both know where it's slotted in in terms of our businesses. AWS, Amazon Web Services, the cloud. Microsoft has a version of the cloud. We all know where we're going to go for certain things. And I think that will happen. We'll go to Bitcoin for a store of value. We'll go to Ethereum for smart contract technology. Uh, there's something called Solana. I believe Algorand will be one of these things where you can run a smart contract platform over the system and it's in a distributed decentralized ledger so that we can transact with each other fairly seamlessly and we can start to unlock value in things that were typically not liquid or not tradable you know and so that all of that stuff is happening for our society and uh, I want my clients to be part of it I want them to understand it I want them to take a small position in it uh, because even if we're wrong, if you take a 1% position in something and I'm wrong, it's not wiping you out. But if I'm right, it could grow to a 10% position just organically, you know, and that, that, that's my message to people. So, and, and I'm one of these newbies too, when it comes to crypto, so I'm no expert in it. We certainly dated both of us by referring to the Dewey Decimal System and pets.com and 1999, uh, in general, but the, um, the difference between a casual the reminder to your young viewers that uh, sometimes people that have experience <laughs> have been crushed and humbled by their experiences are, uh, you know, you can advantage yourself to their experiences. You know, I, 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 I laugh at the generational struggle that we have, right? Because my children who are millennials think I'm an imbecile. I obviously think they're an imbecile on certain things. But the truth of the matter is we should both calm down and try to learn from each other and cross synergize. They're not going to listen to you. They'll listen to me, but they're not going to listen to you. Yeah, that's a, that's another that's another axiomatic fact. I can send my kid to you and he'll take your advice, but he certainly won't take mine. Same same here. Uh, I, you know, I think I think about the the idea for the investor. So the, so the investor is looking to get access to their financial advisors. How how can they 
invest in this? How can they invest with SkyBridge specifically? How do you make this? Well, it's tough. It's investment? tough. It's tough right now because the regulation is prohibitive. You know, so right now, ProShares has a Bitcoin futures ETF. You can buy that. But if you really understand the futures and the cash markets, there's a slackening there and you're losing value because of the arbitrage that's going on between cash and futures. Uh, Gary Gensler would only approve a Bitcoin futures ETF because he knows it's regulated by the CFTC, something he was once chairman of. And so he's very comfortable with the price discovery in those markets. So we have to get Gary comfortable that the cash Bitcoin which will eventually trade on a regulated exchange in the U.S. When that happens, and I think that will happen likely by the first half of next year, he'll get comfortable and he'll approve a cash ETF. And so that'll be the best way for clients to access it. So in the meantime, I went to my clients and said, listen, I can give you a cash Bitcoin and a private partnership. You can come into my private partnership. You can own the cash Bitcoin. The problem with that is I have to lock you up for three months. You can go to a company like Grayscale, uh, and they'll buy you the Bitcoin in a trust. So it's basically a closed-end fund, Kevin, where that closed-end fund can trade at a premium or it can trade at a discount, and you can't control that. You know, So you could buy the Bitcoin, but it may trade at a discount someday. You'll be selling your Bitcoin below cash. It may trade to a premium, and then you'll be buying the Bitcoin at a premium, You know, and it's very hard to discern. And so... And I like Grayscale. They've done a phenomenal job. They got probably fifty billion dollars under management. They're brilliant guys. Uh, this is not a knock on them. I'm just saying they were trying to get a successful, a regulatory successful product online. Early enough. But the best, the best product is an ETF. Uh, the second best product, I believe, is my our product, which is we teamed up with First Trust, First Trust Bitcoin uh, Skybridge Fund where we have filed for the ETF, Kevin. And so the money that's in our first trust Skybridge Bitcoin fund will roll into an ETF uh, pursuant to when the SEC eventually approves one. So so I like, I like uh, the exposure now. I told people, listen, when we were buying these things, eight to $10,000 a coin, I said, I don't want to wait till the ETF is approved. Of course, when the ETF got approved on October 6th, the coin shot up to, 68,000. The coins are weak right now because there's a tremendous amount of selling going on in China. Uh, you'll notice that the overnight activity on Bitcoin last four weeks has been uh, bearish because the Chinese government has said if you own Bitcoin at UOB, the exchange there, uh, and you don't sell it by December 31st, you know, you're no longer going to own it. We're going to take it from you. Uh, the other thing they've said Obviously, there's no mining, kicked out all the miners. And then the last thing that they 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 said to Evergrande, which is a real estate property developer over there that went bankrupt, well, well documented, high profile bankruptcy, they had Bitcoin on their balance sheet and they were instructed that they needed to sell it. So we've got some short term selling pressure on Bitcoin right now, but that will be offset, I predict, in 2022 by a widespread demand for Bitcoin, I think it will come from institutions larger than Skybridge, frankly. And you're doing the same thing with Ethereum. Hopefully that'll become an ETF at some point. You can roll the trust Correct. into the, or the, the fund into an ETF. Correct. And I'm frankly doing the same thing with Algorand. So the, my, my three cryptocurrencies are Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Algorand. Do investors need to be accredited to get access to your strategy? Right now, now they, right, an ETF? right now they do. Now, if you want, you can come into something that we're calling CRPT which is you know, shorthand for crypt, CRPT. It is an ETF we took public on the New York Stock Exchange with First Trust. It's really called the First Trust Skybridge Digital Economy and Cryptocurrency Portfolio. And so what is that? That would be MicroStrategy, publicly traded company, a holder of Bitcoin. It would be Coinbase, you know, the exchange, which is the largest now in the United States for cryptocurrencies. It would be PayPal. But also include, you know, MasterCard and Visa, uh, some of the miners like Marathon Digital Assets. And so we basically have a basket of 30 stocks in our ETF that track the cryptocurrency markets. And, you know, we started that two months ago. We got about $80 million in it today. It's done well. It's a little weaker because crypto's weak right now. Uh, but I think that over the next 
six to 24 months, that will be a major home run for people. And that's something anybody can access. You can buy one share of that today from your broker, CRPT on the New York Stock Exchange. So I am trying to create products that are not just for accredited investors, but for everybody. And I'm trying to get people exposed to these things, uh, mm -hmm. which I think long term, uh, they'll be very happy that they they've got that exposure. The concept is great. I think having access to individual investors through ETFs is phenomenal. I run an ETF. I love the accessibility to not accredited investors. Tell me a little bit about Algorand because that's something I haven't heard of. At least I've heard of Ethereum. I've heard of Bitcoin. I kind of understand the two differences that and you alluded to them earlier. Touch on that for a second. So again, I don't, I don't want to bore people, but what do you want from if you're going to have a currency that is not linked to a government and a central bank, what would some of the properties that you'd want in that currency? Well, the, the, the three things that we think that you would want are scalability. You'd want to be able to scale it so that it could become something that everybody universally could trade in. You'd want security. You don't want that hacked. You don't want to double spend. You don't want me to send my Bitcoin to you, simultaneously send it to someone else and get value from two people off of one coin, that's sort of counterfeiting. So you don't want that. So you want security. And then the third thing that you want is decentralization because if you have a centralized authority, they could corrupt the currency. They could, they could inflate the currency, create more currency for themselves. They could, uh, they could do things that are capricious to the currency. So it's called the trilemma, okay, in cryptocurrency speak. That's scalability, security, and decentralization. Well, every one of these currencies has issues related to those things, okay? Uh, Bitcoin is not hackable, it's very secure, but it's had problems in terms of transaction speeds. And so scalability has been an issue for Bitcoin. They're fixing that with something called the Lightning Network, and that's working quite beneficially for Bitcoin. But if you were sitting there, you'd say, okay, Bitcoin has that issue. Ethereum is quite scalable, uh, but it's not that decentralized. You know, Vitalik and Joe, who, who created it, um, are basically, uh, you know, they can control it. You know, they, they've inflated it at times. They've been burning some of it off now. Uh, and so you would say, okay, well, that's not super decentralized. Okay, both are relatively secure, although Ethereum has had some down moments. Bitcoin's system has never gone down. Um, and so a guy by the name of Silvio Macaulay, a MIT professor, literally one of the leading thinkers in cryptography uh, on the internet, uh, studied these things and said, okay, listen, I can create something that I think solves the trilemma. That would be the scalability, the decentralization, and the security. And so he created something called Algorand, which is shorthand for algorithmic randomization. And and basically, he launched the coin in 2018. <coughs> the coin did poorly. Why? Uh, the initial coin offering was poorly distributed. And so I guess he gave, they gave it out to some of their friends who didn't really understand what it was. They didn't lock them up. And they started selling the coin. Uh, and so the coin went from like $3.55 on its opening down into the 20 cents zone. Uh, and then it started building itself back up from there. But here's what we learned about it. It is technically superior to the other crypto graphs and the other cryptocurrencies that are out there. And so the best way I could describe this to you and your listeners is, let's say we were back in the 1990s and you and I were accessing the internet through something called Alta Vista, or maybe it was Lycos, <clears throat> or maybe it was our Netscape browser, uh, or it could have been Ask Jeeves. And so they had the market. They were controlling the market. And then there was another company called Google that entered the space. And Google said, well, yeah, those guys are controlling the market right now, but we have better technology. We have faster technology. And we've improved on the search mechanisms. And through our algorithms, this thing is constantly relearning itself. And it's going to stay ahead of everybody else. And so a lot of people, Kevin, scoffed at that. Well, why the hell do I need that? And of course, you know, Google went out and ate everybody's lunch. I think that's going to happen with Algorand. I actually think Algorand has the technical properties where as developers start to understand it and it becomes easier for developers to work with it, uh, they'll use it. 
And the reason I feel strongly about this is companies like AXA, uh, one of the largest, it's a French based, but it's one of the largest uh, insurance companies in the world, after studying all these different cr cryptocurrencies, went with Algorand. Uh, companies like uh, uh, Ashley Furniture went with Algorand. Uh, or, uh, the larger the company and the more due diligence that's done, you're seeking the best technology as opposed to what's out there right now. And so that's why I like Algorand. And, you know, and it's capped at 10 billion algos, so it can't go any higher than that. And it's been fully decentralized by this very broad group of governance, uh, which is the Algorand community. Well, so let's let's take it and fast forward it to something really great, because when you started the SALT conference, we touched on it earlier. It was, it was 2009. Obama didn't want financial firms having conferences. You did all that. You created something from nothing and made what is now, without a doubt, the go-to financial conference in the U.S., if not the world. This year, you brought it home to New York City. It was live. It was packed with people. I mean, how did that make you feel? I mean, you're bringing us all down with your White House stories. Let's talk about well, something. Private. Well, yeah. So let I mean, but let's take it down to earth, right? Because I got asked once. I was at Seton Hall uh, many years ago. The kid raises his hand. He's like, "Could you please describe the strategic brilliance of coming up with the Salt Conference?" I looked at the kid. I was like. Okay, let me just tell you what happened. Okay. We were going bankrupt, okay? Sky Bridge was about to be no bridge. It was about to be the bridge to nowhere, blown up bridge. We were having gallows humor inside the firm. And I was like, we're going to get wiped out here. I'm probably going to end up as a third-party marketer for hedge fund managers. And so when Obama said not to go to Vegas, and again, I don't think he did anything on purpose. He was just trying to say, you know, we just gave you $25 billion of TARP money. Calm yourselves down. Uh, he said, now's not the time to go to Vegas. Everybody that had TARP money, Kevin canceled on Vegas. And so I was like, okay, this is a big opportunity. I can, I can put a conference here. The rooms at that time were going for $99 a night. I'm probably going out of business and this could be a new business for me. <laughs> That's how I made the decision. Okay. So, so then you fast forward, it looks like this brilliant thing. Okay. And it, you know, obviously worked out, but it could have been, the going away party on the Titanic, you know, I mean, who the hell knows, but there's a lesson in that for your viewers and your listeners. You don't have to be strategically brilliant. What you have to do is try things. What you have to do is you have to overcome your self-consciousness about potential failure. You have to not care about it. Now that's impossible. So you have to care a little less about it. You know, you know, my, my grandmother used to tell me, Hey man, what other people think of you is none of your business. And so I've tried to live my life by that, but I got to be honest with you, if you're a human being, so of course you care what other people think of you. You don't, you know, it's not like you're, I'm not going to tell you, Hey, what other people think of you is none of your business. And then tell you, I've lived like that every single day of my life. Of course I haven't. I get worried about what other people think of me, but you got to try to care a little less, Kevin. You see what I mean? Yeah, so but even decisions like to do the salt conference, care a little less and accept if it doesn't work out you'll survive it. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I think, you know, I'll speak for me, some of the greatest successes I have had similar to, to this um, story about your, your experience with salt is just right place, right time and being very, very lucky being surrounded by super smart people who helped me and, and being able to grasp onto that luck and, and, to, and not forfeit that opportunity. Anthony, thank you so much. I can't tell you how fun, much fun this had. I know we went a little bit over. We'll try no, to do some my, editing my, on it. My pleasure. Great, great fun for me. I appreciate it, Kevin.